Welcome to Lawton Online with your host, Andrew Lawton. He's locked, loaded, and ready to fire. Lawton Online starts right now. Good afternoon and welcome to you, or good evening, or good morning. I don't know when you're listening. That's the benefit of a podcast, right? I, I know, by the way, I've used that joke before. But, uh, well, you know, it's my show. I can do what I want. <laughs> I kid, I kid, I kid. It is uh, great to have you here on the program. My name is Andrew Lawton, and you're tuned in to Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. Got to tell you, I am unfortunately still sick. I think the, the voice is coming back slowly but surely. <laughs> I remember last week it was uh, it was tough getting through it. And, and unfortunately, I've had so many things happen health-wise. When I get a cold, my immune system uh, just hates me. I mean, it, basically, uh, it's because I apparently have, have treated it so poorly in the past. When I get a cold, first off, it happens all the time throughout the year. And secondly, it stays with me for, for like days and days and days and days. So we're into like week two of it now. But uh, the good news is that I can, you know, stop and go, stop and go and, you know, take a break between segments to go and run some water, or, you know, drink some, you know, bourbon or, or whatever the case may be. That's good for a cold, isn't it? In any case, lots of great stuff coming up on the show today, talking later on about a uh, really, really interesting uh, story out of the U.S. where Target has decided to move away from sex-based signage, and uh, we'll be talking about that and lots of other stuff coming up in the show uh, over the next uh, few moments here, and also going to be talking, speaking about sex, about a party that I'm actually going to lead off with right now, taking place this weekend Timing with the Para Pan Am Games, which is obviously the, uh, the the version of the Pan Am Games for those who are disabled, in Toronto. Now, it's not officially hosted by anyone connected to the Para Pan Am Games, but the organizers are hoping that people who are involved in the Para Pan Am Games may come to the party. And it is a sex party. Now, it's been heralded by some media outlets as being a disabled orgy. The organizers themselves have not used the orgy moniker, although I interviewed one of them earlier this week on my radio show, and he said that, you know, technically anything could happen. So there could be an orgy there, but the event is is merely a sex-positive, clothing-optional, lingerie-encouraged event taking place at a theater in Toronto. Basically, it's an event for disabled people to show up, take off their clothes, and if they'd like to copulate, they may absolutely do so. I don't particularly care. I mean, I, I'm a, a bit of a libertarian in this respect. If a bunch of people want to have sex in theater, that is absolutely their right to do, disabled or not. My issue comes in here. The theater, an LGBTQ theater space in Toronto, known as Buddies in Bad Times, received last year $350,000 in taxpayer money since 2011. The theater has received over a million dollars in taxpayer money. Now, now this is a theater that is playing host to it. It's actually organized by a sex club in Toronto called the Oasis Aqua Lounge with the help of two disability awareness advocates, Andrew Morrison Gerza and Stella Parakarova, both of whom are in a wheelchair and apparently quite uh, eager to uh, encourage uh, people who are also in wheelchairs to have sex in Toronto. And, and you know what? If it's going to happen in any city, Toronto or, or Vancouver seem like the ones that uh, this would go on in. But regardless, this is going on. And I have to question not the motivation of why disabled people want to have sex. I would assume that despite any stigma that they uh, see existing in society, absolutely, people are people. People are uh, sexual beings. That's fine. Their business, not mine. I have to question why this is something that at all should be near a space that has received public money. You can split hairs over whether or not it's an orgy. This is $1 million going towards an arts venue that is profiting off of people having sex, people paying to have sex. You know, I, I got to share something with you. Don't worry, it's not dirty. It is personal, though. Back in 2009, six, six years, by the way, from last Saturday, I had a stroke. Now, a lot of you in the, in the blogosphere may have uh, heard about this when it happened. Uh, many of you may not have. That's fine. I had a stroke, and for a time, I was in a wheelchair. 
got into therapy and was in uh, or walked with a walker and then with a cane. And now, for the most part, I have uh, no major deficits. They're known as I am still a conservative. So no brain damage was was in effect there. But the, what happened was I was basically disabled and, and not basically I was disabled. I had the parking pass and everything. I never felt that I was deserving of a taxpayer-funded orgy. Now, had I known now, or had I known then what I know now that this was an option, maybe I would have looked at things entirely differently. I mean, maybe this is just a a true example here of a missed opportunity. I didn't even know this was offered to me, but uh, apparently it was. I I find it funny, though, because the the fact that it's a, a, a party for disabled people, I think certainly makes it pique the curiosity of more people. I think that's relatively insignificant in the grand scheme of things. The fact is, I have to wonder why sex is so publicly funded in the first place. And it's not just this. Sexuality is embraced as a part of art, as film. I mean, there have been near pornographic films that have been uh, quite uh, widely uh, funded by grants in Canada, by the Can- Canadian Arts Council, etc. When the Conservative government wanted to put in a bill that would put a basically a morality panel, a- an independent and nonpartisan morality panel to look at uh, reviews of art projects wanting funding, the arts community cried out that this was censorship and they needed to be liberated and and who dare you know tell them not to have you know, nudity in film and, and that was never what was on the table. But you've had some absolute nonsense that has been passed off specifically in Canadian film, which has been porn passed off as art and receiving a lot of public funding. So now you've got this buddies in bad times theater. A theater, an LGBTQ theater, receiving a million bucks in government grants in the last five years. Why does a theater need to have a sexual orientation? How does a theater have a sexual orientation? I've looked at some of the shows that have been put on there, and a lot of them are very highly sexual. And and look, I don't care. I'm not a prude. I'm not someone who supports censorship. But I'm also not someone who thinks that not funding something is tantamount to wanting to censor it. No, you can do whatever you want. Just don't reach into my pocket, you know, before my pants come off to pay for it. It's a pretty simple formula. So though the event is actually taking place this Friday, it was actually back in early June that it was uh, brought up uh, in terms of the funding. And oddly enough, it was actually a UK publication, Breitbart.com UK, that actually uncovered where the money was coming from. Now, Christine Van Gein, Ontario Director for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, has called out the money that the group received in grants and and says, you know, the fact that this is paying for their staff space and operating budget uh, presents a little bit of a dilemma when we see highways literally falling down and taxes going up. She said, and I, I don't know how she did it with a straight face, quote, subsidizing any kind of orgy should not be a priority for public funds. I think it's kind of funny here because... If we look at the question of sexuality and and the funding of sexuality, is it too much of an old-fashioned concept to say, why is this not being kept in the bedroom? You know, it was Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Trudeau, who said years and years ago the famous quote, you know, government has no place in the bedrooms of the nation. Well, why are we projecting the behaviors of the bedroom onto publicly funded stages? Interesting little tidbit of information. The same group that's behind the taxpayer uh, funded uh, or the taxpayer funded group that's behind this orgy here, Oasis Aqua Lounge, a sex club in Toronto. This is not the first I had ever heard of them. Now, I'm not telling you anything you shouldn't know there, but a few years ago, Oasis Aqua Lounge was the host of another taxpayer funded orgy. This one for students. Yes, University of Toronto, one of the student clubs at the university, one of the clubs which, by the way, had been deemed by the university to be an essential service, and thus such received university funds and a mandatory levy from student tuition fees, which in the case of U of T, being a public institution, are very heavily subsidized by uh, public funds, was having a student orgy, a student orgy at a club in Toronto. And again, it is not a surprise to me that university students are hooking up and having sex. Anyone who's surprised by that needs to sorely uh, check themselves and, and realize that, hey, apparently that's all university is for now. 
So no, the problem is not that kids are having sex or students are having sex. The problem is that other people are expected to pay for it. And it's funny, you know, Mark Mark Stein made a a comment uh, a couple of years ago when the Sandra Fluke controversy had erupted. And she was talking about, you know, uh, the need for uh, obviously everyone to pay for her birth control and whatnot. And there was another student, a male student at another school that said, you know, the university should also pay for birth control for men, etc. And and Mark Stein had said, and I I can't remember the exact quote, but the the sentiment is true. It's an accurate paraphrase. He he basically said in terms of his his dating advice to, to the women listening, he said, ladies, Never sleep with a man that's not prepared to pay for his own condoms. And and that generally, I think, could be applied here as well. Ladies and gentlemen, never engage in sexual relations with someone who literally needs a subsidized stage on which to have the sexual relations. It seems like then we're looking at a uh, a huge area. Well, maybe not huge. I I don't want to uh, make any of the guys feel insecure. But it's certainly an area where, uh, of all the places we could make an argument the government is involved in and doesn't need to be, this is probably near the top of the list. The event is called Deliciously Disabled, a sex-positive party. Well, I'm pretty sure every party, if you give enough alcohol to the people there, is going to be a sex-positive party. So I I don't get why this is even an issue. You know, the, the organizers have been trying to make this out to be an example of people being disgusted by the fact that people with disabilities have sex. And the funny thing is, when I look at a lot of the criticism about the event, no one actually cares. A number of people I've seen online have said, good for them, but I don't want to be paying for it. And that's my position as well. I don't care what people want to do behind closed doors. I don't even care what people want to do on a stage. You know what? If that's your thing, that's your thing. Apparently, voyeurism is is something that uh, people actually find desirable. That's fine. Don't let me pay for it. And, you know, it's funny, the the not in my backyard talking point, you know, nimbyism, as they say, has grossly evolved to not in my back pocket now. And and that's basically it. I mean, my my general rule with, with anything is do what you want. Don't maybe pay for it and don't infringe on my rights at all. And no, my, my rights are not being infringed upon here at all. But I, I, I reject this idea that having an orgy for disabled people is in any way a human right. But this is what organizers are saying. They're saying it's a human rights issue. Stella Palagorova, the disability awareness consultant, who's uh, one of the co-organizers of this, says, quote, access to sexuality is such a major barrier for people with disabilities. I don't think there's any other group in society that, depending on the level of their physical limitation, can't even pleasure themselves sexually. It says, imagine going through life completely unable to have any sort of sexual relief or even to think that you are perceived by others as sexually desirable or a sexual person. That becomes a major human rights issue for me. Now, as someone who, for reasons that have nothing to do with disabilities, I believe also lives with people not finding me sexually desirable, I don't think that's a human rights violation. I, I believe it's just called, in my case, you know, being fat. I'm not sure for, for other people if there are reasons there. But, but I, can, can we honestly wrap our heads around this idea here? Not being someone who turns people on is now a human rights issue. Yeah. I I know disabled people that are in relationships with able-bodied people. I know disabled people that are in relationships with other disabled people. I don't talk to them about their sexuality because it's none of my business, and I don't really care. And I don't really want to know. Same as I don't want to know about my able-bodied friends and their sex lives. But, But the fact of the matter is, like any relationship, these are things that people work out and can work out behind closed doors. I don't know why we need to have a national discussion around it. For that matter, I don't know why we need to have a national strategy to try to deal with it. Of all the priorities for the provincial government, of all the priorities for the federal government, is this really at the top of the list? No, I I think Christine Van Guy nailed it. You know, with highways crumbling and taxes going up, taxpayer-funded orgies of any kind, able-bodied, non-able-bodied, not really a big issue. But then I have to wonder if we need to to bring it one step further. You know, there was a great piece, and by great I mean terrible piece, in Vice uh, a couple of months ago 
by a black woman from my hometown, London, Ontario. She was writing about how London, Ontario was, in her words, quote, a racist asshole, unquote. And she was talking about how she encountered so many racist people and talking about how she encountered so many people that she thought didn't like her because she was black. And and even though London's a pretty progressive town and it's a college town and we have people from all over the world here, she had written about all of the instances she endured, which were basically men making comments about how they only wanted to sleep with her because they'd never slept with a black girl before. And she wrote a a piece on Huffington Post months prior in which she touched on a lot of the same themes. And, And what I found funny about this was that She was complaining about why people wanted to have sex with her. It's like, no, 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 I want them to do it because they find me attractive, not because they find me attractive because of my race. Well, I I don't think you get to be picky. I don't think you get to be choosy. And it's the same thing with the, this, this disabled party. And I mentioned when I interviewed uh, one of the organizers on my radio show, I said, look, are, are you concerned that this could be something that for some people is not about just embracing people of different body types, but is about this fetishistic desire to just be turned on by someone who's got a disability? And he said he's aware of it, but, you know, ultimately they're, they're, all they're going to do is monitor for consent and, and make sure that everything is, is, is kosher in that respect. Because ultimately, if your problem is that people aren't wanting to have sex with you and then someone's wanting to have sex with you, well, I guess there you go. You got what you wanted out of it. Now, I realize this is an awkward conversation for a lot of people, and and I'm not sorry because I'm I'm not squeamish about it. I'm not prudish about it. But it's a very simple line that I have to wonder if maybe we talk about sex too much in society. And and I realize it's funny to, to, you know, suggest that after literally a a 15-minute rant on talking about a a topic pertaining and directly relating to sex and sexuality. But the the point I'm trying to make here is that I don't think we need to have a national discussion on what is now the least taboo topic in the English language. Rife with innuendos and euphemisms, filled, filled with examples of people literally wanting to talk about this. I mean, every pop star in the world is talking about their sex life and who they're sleeping with and this and that and and, and giving their thoughts. And you can look, and I'm sure, on any magazine cover when you're waiting in line at the grocery store checkout counter and you're seeing stuff there about, you know, great sex tips for this and, and that. And, and, and that's fine. That's absolutely fine. It's a part of human nature. But why is this now so ingrained in something that has to be funded. This is where it's it's the ultimate irony here, because the whole point of that everyone that talks about this sort of free thinking, free flowing sexual liberation, what the point they miss is that they're saying this is natural, it's human, it's normal, we can't be afraid of it, we need to embrace it and open our arms and presumably our legs. But if it is that, if it is so natural and so omnipresent, if you will, Why does it need to be bolstered? Why does it need to be subsidized? Why does it need to be embraced? Why can't it just be? Why do you need to celebrate something that already is so natural and so there? And look, for the people on Friday that are going to get together in Toronto at the Buddies and Bad Times Theatre and have a romp on stage or behind stage, whatever the case may be, I don't know the layout, good on you. I hope you have fun. It's 20 bucks for a ticket. Your caretakers get in free. Sounds like a steal at twice the price. But ultimately, the fact that my money is going into this bothers me more than anything else that's happening. We've got to take a break here. When we come back, more Lawton Online on the Rebel.media. I'm Andrew Lawton. Stay tuned. He's irreverent, intelligent, and indefatigable. You're tuned in to Lawton Online with Andrew Lawton. And we're back here on Lawton Online on the Rebel.media. So this segment, it's uh, kind of an interesting one because I, I want to talk about two stories that are unrelated to each other, but I believe anyway have a very, very common thread between them. And it ultimately comes down to a... Well, two questions, actually. Number one, what criteria must your employer meet before they're going to fire you as an employee, if any? And number two, what happens if you're selling something that you don't want to buy? And in two contexts here, 
the same point, I think, is made. The first is a a case out of Quebec where a judge has reprimanded a former employee of Provigo, which is a convenient or a grocery store chain in Quebec, has reprimanded the employee for her disloyalty. What happened was in 2013, a woman by the name of Nancy Bolia was terminated by the owner of the Provigo store in which she worked in the town of saint michel des saint after she told a customer that an item that uh, he was buying could be purchased for more cheaply at a Walmart nearby. Now, one of the big differences between Provigo and Walmart is that Walmart is known for its employees not being unionized, and as such, it's able to offer services and goods at a much cheaper price than normally, and the grocery store, Provigo, had unionized employees. And obviously, when labor is more expensive, you have to charge more for things. So, the employee was... After working there for 18 years, telling a customer that she didn't know actually had a connection to the owner of the store. It wasn't a trap. It was an unsolicited offer, an unsolicited uh, offer of assistance, I should add, that something was cheaper at Walmart. Tough luck. The employee got fired. The union filed a grievance. A court ruled in favor of the employer saying that the employee was disloyal and that it was a serious fault. So I'll get back to that story in a second. The other one that I wanted to tie into this, and as I said, I mean, it couldn't be further from the root in terms of what happened, but if you'll bear with me here, you'll understand how it connects, is the story of a United Church of Canada minister by the name of Greta Vosper, who may be at risk of being defrocked and essentially fired by the United Church because she is an atheist. Because she, by her own admission, does not believe in God and has been quite open and candid about that fact with her uh, congregants since 2001. So now, the second is a problem that is rooted in the culture of the United Church of Canada. Liberal, very anti-Israel, very pro-climate change, uh, very tolerant and progressive, so much so, so open-minded that the brains have fallen out in a lot of ways. And as much as there may be some, you know, old guard United Church members that have been there since, you know, the 60s and 70s, for the most part, I, I think most Christians have recognized that the United Church has in, in many ways lost its way. It's become more of a left-wing political institution than anything else. But like Nancy Beaulieu, Greta Vosper is clearly selling something that is not what the parent company wants sold. In the case of Reverend Vosper, I'm not even sure we can call her a reverend, but that is technically her title, as she is technically ordained. In the case of Vosper, she's selling godlessness in a church. In the case of Nancy Beaulieu, she's selling Walmart products in a Provigo. They're they're really not all that dissimilar, the cases, and it comes down to whether or not any brand, whether the brand is a a church denomination, and I'm not saying that to be little uh, church denominations, but any any organization, any institution does have and, and is a brand. It's whether or not a brand has the right to protect its brand by getting rid of people that pose a risk to it. That's basically what the conversation comes down to. And what I find funny is that people have jumped on the Provigo manager, Provigo franchise owner, for firing that cashier because what the cashier did was actually helpful. The cashier was actually helping a customer out, and they should be rewarded for that, not fired for that. At the end of the day, if you're a medium-sized business and you're competing with Walmart, you'll never be able to compete on price. The only thing you can compete on is service. But if that service is literally sending people to your competition, I'm pretty sure it makes it difficult to to play ball with that. So I'm of two minds on this issue, because on, on one hand, I feel bad for the employee. Because in some cases, I've been given very good help by someone, and someone at a store has told me, you know what, sir, there's no way we can beat them on price. You should go there. And I've remembered that. And sure, maybe I buy the one thing at the other store, but it's going to make me buy the next 10 things from the one store where I remembered they were honest with me. And they didn't try to sell me something at a more expensive rate. But at the other, on the other hand, rather, if you're a medium-sized business and you're already operating on pretty low profit margins and one of your longest-serving employees is literally sending people to your immediate competition, that seems to be a bit of a big problem. 
So in that case, you're, you're dealing with something that's a bit different than this case. But at the same time, some customers would respond to that and be very happy, just as some customers are responding to Greta Vosper's sermons and are, are quite happy. She is a congregation of 50. And yeah, you're dealing with 50 godless people that I don't really care what they call themselves are not Christians because they're literally preaching or listening to the preaching from a self-proclaimed heretic. I mean, she doesn't call herself that, but she's acknowledged that she doesn't believe in God. The congregation had 150 and then went down to 50. She calls the Bible mythology. She tried to do away and successfully did it, eradicated the Lord's Prayer from services at her church called West Hill in Toronto in 2008. Since then, the 50 members there are the ones that are sticking through with thick and thin. And what I find hilarious is that the United Church's own political stance on everything, priding itself on tolerance and diversity inclusiveness, is, ironically enough, the reason they're having trouble getting rid of her, because they don't want to risk seeming intolerant. And yes, people have even said it would be violating her right to be free from discrimination if they got rid of her and discriminating against her, a minister in a Christian denomination, by the way, based on her religious beliefs. Yeah, this is the type of stuff that is really stranger than fiction in a lot of ways, folks. You know, I was talking a few moments ago on the uh, the podcast about the uh, deliciously disabled uh, orgy party. And, you know, I was talking about the fact that apparently you now have a, a human right uh, to be uh, sexually desired by other people. Well, now you also have a human right to be a uh, an atheist in a Christian church and not be discriminated against. You know, we're just adding, you know, by, by leaps and bounds, the number of uh, human rights that apparently exist from which people need uh, protection of discrimination, folks. I know, if you can't keep up, we'll try to come up with a book of just, you know, am I protected? And it'll just be one index that has basically uh, the list of, of potential grievance groups that we're creating here, and you can decide for yourself whether or not you actually fit into that group. Actually, there might actually be a, a pretty big business uh, business idea here. So I, I find it funny. I, I'm very rarely going to find myself defending the United Church of Canada. And the reason I am in this case is not because I agree with its theology, but I agree with its right to decide for itself who is an agent of that theology. And not get me wrong, don't get me wrong. I mean, not so secretly, I'm kind of happy that their own uh, policy of, of tolerance over theology and tolerance over truth is coming back to bite them in the rear end. I find that kind of amusing that now they'll basically sort of start to cannibalize themselves and maybe go back to teaching religion instead of politics. But that's another issue altogether. And when we look at the Provigo case here, again, any company has the right to decide for itself who they want representing the brand. And it's funny because people have said, well, you know, what does it matter what you believe in your own time, what you believe in your own life and what you do in your own personal time and all that sort of stuff? And we've seen this in other areas as well. I can't remember if I was talking about it on the podcast or not, but going back a few months, there was that case where a Hydro One employee in Ontario was fired for, you know, yelling effort right in the pussy to a, a reporter on TV. And people have said, well, you know, why should he have been fired? You know, that was his own personal life. And well, because he brought disrepute onto his company. You know, if you're a Coke executive and you're photographed drinking Pepsi at a restaurant, that's probably going to go back and reflect poorly on you. You know, you can't work for Coke and then drink Pepsi in your spare time and expect that no one's going to care about it. Same as if a priest was going to a mosque in his spare time. I'm assuming the Catholic Church might have an issue with it if he was going in a capacity other than just to, you know, bridge the gap between different faiths. If a rabbi was eating at a eating a Baconator at Wendy's, I'm pretty sure that people would have a couple of issues to bring up about it. So it's not at all discriminatory, not in a million years, to say that an atheist shouldn't have the right to preach in a Christian denomination or at least one that posits itself as that. Nor should it be bad to say that a Provigo employee should not be sending customers to Walmart. This is not controversial. It's not discriminating. It's not overbearing. It's not draconian. It is simply a matter of common sense. He who pays the piper calls the tune. You ever heard that expression? If you're the one paying the bills, you have a, a sense of ownership or at least license over how someone is behaving. 
If I'm paying you to be the best ambassador for Provigo, you can. If I'm paying you to represent Provigo and sell Provigo products and sell people them and, and give them a smile when they're doing it, then darn it, I expect you to be doing that. I don't expect you to be sending people to Walmart. Now, if you want to say that you were giving the best customer service you can, then great, but I don't think that was the case. I think some people just get basically checked out after a certain number of years working for the same company, and that seems to be what happened in the case of Nancy Beaulieu. Certainly, it was what happened in the case of Reverend Vosper. Checked out a decade ago from actually believing in God and found out, hey, she can make more money as an atheist by, you know, writing a book deal and doing the media circuit than anything else, and here we are today still talking about her. And it's funny because I've known about her for, for years and years now, and I, I didn't know that anyone else really cared. It was one of those things where I may have mentioned it as an aside on the show a couple of times on my radio show and, and in interviews and whatnot, but it was such a, an under-the-radar issue. So I was actually uh, quite amused when I learned it actually was coming up to a vote. It was actually going to be something that the United Church Conference was going to deal with because they're reviewing her right now. They don't have a process to do it. I should probably explain this. The ruling in May laid out the review process that could lead to her defrocking. She's going to be appealing it before an ecclesiastical court this fall. But there's no mechanism to get rid of her. Despite the fact that she needed to, in order to get that job, declare an oath that she believed in God and the Trinity. If she believed it at the time, ostensibly, there was nothing dishonest about taking that oath. So the, that, that's like saying you need to pass a credit check to, to get hired at a company. But if you know declare bankruptcy after you get hired, then I guess you're fair game because you've already you, it was honest when you did the check. It was honest for her when she made the oath. That's all that matters. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what happens with this one. I, I'm going to be following it, not because I care about what happens in the United Church of Canada, but I'm following it because I, I'm just very interested in seeing what happens when people make their bed and then have to sleep in it. So that'll be interesting for her. I mean, she can't really uh, complain that much about what happens because it's not like she's even been, you know, being a, a faithful steward and, and, and phoning it in. It's not even like she's been saying, oh, you know, what? I'll, but I'll do what I'm expected to do anyway. No, she's been talking about atheism and humanism. She's not even talking about, like, Christianity as though she still believed. So she's quite public and, and proud of her uh, so-called deconversion, which is the nifty name applied to apostasy now. So we'll certainly see what happens with that case, the, uh, the case of Greta Vosper at West Hill Church. Hey, if you're in Toronto and you want to swing by on a Sunday, I am very curious what you encounter. Send me an email. Andrew at andrewlawton.ca. Really, uh, if you can stomach, you know, whatever she's going to be uh, shoving down your throat for an hour on a Sunday morning. I would love to hear about that. we got to take a quick break here. When we come back, more Lawton Online on the Media. Stay tuned. He's unapologetic, unwavering, and unafraid to take on the left sacred cows. He's Andrew Lawton, and you're listening to Lawton Online on the Rebel.media. Welcome back to Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. So i got to be uh, perfectly honest with you right now. I'm probably dressed about as gender neutrally as I could be right now. I'm wearing my uh, nice uh, blue polo shirt. I'm wearing a nice pair of black uh, slacks. I'm looking pretty good. I know you're not supposed to wear black and blue together, and I know you're not supposed to say you're looking good. But the the point is I'm I'm gender neutral right now. I don't think anyone can be offended by the the clothes that I'm wearing right now. But believe it or not, there is a, a political war being waged over the colors of clothes and the colors of toys and all that sort of fun stuff. And uh, what I find interesting is that Target is trying to make a political statement or a a cultural statement or a social statement without really saying that's what they're doing. And and look, let me make this very clear right out at the outset here. I don't uh, deny any private company the right to make decisions for itself and for its own uh, customers and for its own purposes. I don't think that's at all problematic. Good on them. But I I can still call out and spot the non-issues when I see them. 
So let me give you a bit of the backstory here. So last week, Target announced. Now, obviously, Target just left Canada. I don't know if it was earlier this year or late last year. But anyway, they they didn't really last in in this country that long, but they still exist in the U.S. Uh, The retail giant that ultimately tries to compete with Walmart in a lot of areas. Target announced last week on Friday, which is just to note a procedural or or process-based side of this, always peculiar. I mean, no one ever expects to get publicity on a Friday. So when you announce something on a Friday, you always have to question if they're trying to hide it or or do it very quietly. But the announcement was that the store would be moving away from having sex-based signage in some of its departments. Now, this means that when you are going out, you can perhaps look at, okay, I want to go to electronics, I want to go to housewares, okay, I'm looking for outdoors, I'm looking for home and garden, I'm looking for this and that and such and what and all that sort of fun stuff. Well, you can also look for, oh, boys' clothes, girls' clothes, men's clothes, women's clothes, boys' toys, girls' toys. That's what they're getting rid of, not for clothes, but for toys and for bedding. So I didn't realize that betting was really separated down sex lines, but apparently it is. But if you're going and buying toys now, you're not going to anymore have to uh, deal with or navigate the boys and girls section. You're not going to have to deal with boys sheets, girls sheets. It's all going to be in just one big giant area. Now, I don't know if they're still going to be separated based on our preconceived heteronormative lines of what we think a boy's toy is. Maybe you're going to have Barbies next to G.I. Joe's now instead of, you know, Barbies next to, you know, Webkin's next to this, next to that. I don't know. They haven't really unveiled what their their official plan is yet. Except to say that they're also removing the colored backing on some of the shelves. For example, the girls' toys at present are, are backed by pink shelving and pink paper and pink decorative uh, packaging and, and marked as such. And they're, they're going to get rid of that now and, and get rid of all the boys' blue stuff. Now, I don't know when they're going to make the leap and, and start doing this with their clothing sections as well and their apparel sections as well. But it hasn't happened at this point yet. They're just going after toys. Here's the big, huge news alert, news flash for you. I don't care. I don't care that Target is doing this. I don't care that Target is saying this is their, something they're doing because of parents that are expressing their concern. I don't believe it, but I also don't care that much. Because parents have always known this. Parents have always known that not every boy's toy is going to be suitable for every young boy. Not every girl's toy is going to be suitable for every young girl. I think parents have, sensible parents anyway, known for quite some time that some kids are different. Some kids go against the grain. And that's not always a bad thing. That's not always a terrible thing. That's not always a controversial thing. But the problem is now society is so obsessed with gender. Now, you'll note that I was talking about sex-based lines before, sex-based signage. That's certainly the accurate description of what's happening, but Target has called this gender-based signage, gender-based initiatives. Well, the fact is it has nothing to do with gender. Kids are kids. Kids will play with lots of toys. You know, when I was younger, my parents gave me lots of great toys, lots of expensive toys, cool toys, fun toys, trendy toys. And some days, all I wanted to do was just bang around with the lids of pots and bang pans and ladles and spoons and forks against each other. You know, I had a a really nice, I I grew up playing piano, but before I knew how to play piano, I was given this really neat toy uh, trumpet of sorts. And some days I just wanted to bang spoons together because I thought that was a better musical instrument. Kids are not concerned with what toys they're supposed to play with. Kids are not concerned with what toy it's expected they're going to play with. They're going to pick up what they want to play with anyway. And in the case of most boys who, let's face it, do have different interests for the most part than girls, they're going to be drawn towards things like trucks and things like cars and things like guns and things like manly or boyish activities. That doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just a fact of life. This is how kids view these things. And and I don't necessarily think that it's all just a part of human nature. I think in some cases it's a matter of whatever's put in front of them. 
if parents are raising kids with Barbies in front of them and they're all boys, well, maybe they're going to be more prone to want to play with Barbies. But I think there is also something to be said about a natural gravitational pull towards certain types of things. Either way, I don't think that what you play with as a kid matters that much. I don't think that you playing with Barbies if you're a boy when you're younger is going to turn you gay. I don't think it's going to turn you into a woman. I don't think it's going to turn you into Caitlyn Jenner. I think it means that you're a young boy that likes to play with Barbies. And you know what? Up until the point where you're getting uh, bullied because of it at school, I don't think there are any problems with it. Now, the reason I say that is not because I think that it's your fault if you're uh, getting bullied because you're playing with toys that are not uh, indicative of what those in your sex typically play with. But I also think that parents have an obligation to inform their children how they can best prevent themselves from becoming a victim. So this is all part and parcel of a, a very big problem here that Target is trying to sweep into progressiveness and an embrace by the progressives in dealing with when in actuality it's nothing more than a token gesture. A gesture for Target to say, look, you know, we care about all the transgender children out there. No, all you're doing is taking down a couple of signs over here, over your your products. And, you know, I'm convinced that it's not going to make a big deal at all. I I haven't been to Target in a while, but I was looking up some pictures uh, just in general, for this story of Target and of the toy sections there. And yeah, you can see where Target has put up, you know, pink cardboard and pink displays and all that sort of stuff for the girls and and all the blue stuff for the guys. But the funny thing is the actual packaging of the toys themselves and the color of the toys themselves is in a lot of cases pink for the girls and blue for the boys. And unless the toy manufacturers get on board with this, Target's change, Target's policy shift is not really going to make a huge world of difference on this. Because the fact is, toy manufacturers are still knowing their audience, are still knowing their market, are still promoting their products to boys and girls, depending on what the toy is. But now we're seeing this huge drive, this huge push, and I, and I say huge not because it's actually led by a large volume of people, but it's led by a, a small group of people that have a very loud volume, if you will, pardon the pun. And that's one of gender-neutral everything. Gender-neutral clothes, gender-neutral toys, etc. You know, I was reading a piece on CNN.com about Target's decision here, and it quotes a woman named Melissa atkins Wardy who runs the blog Pigtail Pals and Ball Cap Buddies, which promotes gender-neutral toys, apparels, and other products. And she says, you know, this change will shift the way kids see themselves as consumers and shift the way adults see the role of gender in childhood. I don't think it does anything like that. I think all it does is make it a heck of a lot more confusing every time you're buying a present for uh, your neighbor, buying a present for one of your kids' birthday uh, party classmate uh, events in school. Because now all of a sudden, as a parent, you have, uh, this is, I mean, the worst for dads, you have double the square footage to cover in the stores. It's kind of interesting because I know going back to as, as long as I can remember that I was supposed to not like the color pink as a boy. I don't know why. I don't know where along the lines, where in history, pink became a color for girls and blue became a color for boys. But anyone who's ever had kids can tell you this is exactly how it is. I mean, if you're going to have a baby boy, everyone buys you blue stuff. You're going to have a baby girl, everyone buys you uh, you pink stuff. If you're not telling them the sex of the baby, well, everyone's going to buy you yellow or green, which apparently are neutral colors, even though I would assume that yellow would fall in with pink and green would fall in with blue. What do I know? But that, that's the reality, and I don't know, because you have men that wear pink shirts still. You have girls that can wear pretty much any color. Girls can wear blue, red, black, green, brown, purple. It doesn't matter. I, I don't have any pink shirts myself, but I do have purple shirts. I have a magenta shirt. I have a I have two burgundy shirts, and, and for the most part, I don't think these are, are particularly feminine. But for whatever reason, we've we've isolated boys and girls into nothing short of colors when they're young, from a very young age. All that is pink is girls. All that is blue is boys. And it's stupid. It's stupid, but it's easy. It's easy because when you're dealing with kids and the myriad of decisions that any parent needs to make about their children from a very young age, color is not the thing you want to have to worry about. 
So it's become a very easy way to categorize things. It's a boy, big, bright blue. It's a girl, big, bright pink. So I I don't think that Target's decision to do away with pink and blue and the signs that say girls and boys is as dramatic as other people seem to think it is. I don't think it's a huge example of political correctness run amok as some are fearing. I think political uh, correctness has influenced it. I, I certainly think there's been an impact of that culture there. But I think the bigger problem is all of the people who care about it. All of the people who are clapping their hands together as though this is some big stand for freedom and equality and fairness and justice and all of these other things, when in actuality, I don't think it accomplishes anything. Because if Target does this on Monday, if Target were to have this in effect on Monday, the impact will be non-existent. Boys will still want to play with whatever toys they want to play with now. Girls will still want to play with whatever toys they want to play with now. And it has nothing to do with what society tells them is acceptable. It shouldn't have anything to do with what their parents are telling them is acceptable and should have everything to do with what they want to play with. And every parent that I know already sees it in that way. Now, I'm sure there are a couple of dads out there that are overly cautious that are saying to their kids, no, 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 you can't play with a Barbie. You need to play with a truck. It'll put hairs on your chest. Probably less so with moms, although I'm assuming there are, you know, some moms out there that want their little girls to be girly girls. There are probably, frankly, dads that want their girls to be playing with trucks and guns anyway, just because they're dads and you want to keep them playing with something that's in your wheelhouse. But every parent that I know, is already letting their kids take the lead on what they want to play with. And and you can't make your kids do something they don't want to do. You can try. You can absolutely try. But but, but all you parents out there, how well does that really work? How well does that really work when push comes to shove if you're trying to impose something that your kids really don't want to be dealing with? You know, I've got a far bigger issue when we see what happens with this uh, gender independence movement A couple of years after, when we're looking at what's happening in schools, when we're looking at what's happening in clothing, when we're looking at what's happening in proms, for example. Not even proms as much as uh, much younger ages. In some examples in the U.S. we've heard where teachers have actually been telling kids, hey, you should dress as the opposite sex for the day as a school assignment. I haven't heard of it happening in Canada just yet, but well, give it time. The, these seem to me to be far bigger issues. But at the same time, they're all part of the same movement. They're all part of the same issue. So you have to look at one without the other. So no, so Target is absolutely within its rights to do this. Target is not doing anything that I feel is unlawful. I don't even think they're caving. I don't even think this is a matter of Target cowering to political correctness or to the leftist mob or anything like that. No, I I think, if anything, it's a a pretty easy decision. It's a pretty example, a pretty uh, solid example for them of slacktivism. It's a low-risk, low-cost change that requires nothing other than pulling down signs, and they get to reap the benefits of being embraced by the left. So great, good on them from a business perspective. It's probably the smartest decision they could make in the area. But it's not anything that's changing or fixing any genuine injustices that exist in the world. Not at all, not in a million years. The the funny thing is, you know, I I was quoting from a a CNN.com piece earlier, and there were lots of articles about it, and they were all heralding this. uh, I want to read one line from uh, the CNN piece. It says, Gender equality advocates welcomed the news as a significant step with potential to inspire other retailers. Man, being a gender equality advocate must be a darn full-time job these days because, you know, I I didn't even know that was a job title. Did not even know that was a job title, but apparently you can uh, basically rise to fame by being a gender equality advocate because apparently this is the one area where advocacy is needed above all else. The sexes are equal. Men and women, males and females, boys and girls are equal. Everything else is just a matter of preference. And the toy aisle at Target is no exception to this. We've got to take a break here. When we come back, more Lawton Online on the Rebel.media. Stay with us.
Email your thoughts to Andrew at andrewlawton.ca or tweet Andrew using at Andrew Lawton. Welcome back to Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. So I uh, wanted to talk about prostitution for a couple of moments here. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Bill Clinton just uh, came alert to attention right now. And Well, in more ways than one, actually. But uh, no, not talking about Bill Clinton, talking about the actual legality of prostitution. Because I'm sure a lot of you remember in Canada when the Supreme Court ruled in uh, the Bedford case, prostitution was rendered essentially legal. I mean, it wasn't as clear cut as that, but the Supreme Court basically said that the government has no business denying women the right to access the safe work environments that every other workplace has if they decide they want to enter the sex trade. So the government responded by putting its own spin on what's known as the Nordic model. Now, in simple terms, the Nordic model is a ban on the purchase of sex, but a legalization of the sale of sex. In other words, prostitution is legal for the women, or men, theoretically, legal for the prostitutes, illegal for the Johns. Now, let's just take a moment to ignore the hypocrisy of that. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But the reality is this is a decision that united in a lot of very strange ways the Christian right and half of the feminist movement. Specifically the radical feminists, but the, the, the radical feminists and the Christian right and most conservatives in Canada all sort of came under one banner for this legislation, which I, I found quite interesting. And even though I didn't really agree with the legislation, I, I found it interesting that it reminded us of how much the old saying goes, politics makes for strange bedfellows. Well, now Amnesty International has come out this week, and not because of Canada, but certainly responding to a lot of growing concern about the issue in the world, passed a policy on Tuesday endorsing the decriminalization of the sex trade. This was at a decision-making forum in Dublin, Amnesty obviously being the uh, human rights watchdog, to which I generally pay no attention, approved the resolution that recommends and lobbies for, quote, full decriminalization of all aspects of consensual sex work. Now, they've thrown in the word consensual as a way to deflect from the human trafficking discussion, which if you look at most countries in the world that have prostitution issues, it's actually coming through human trafficking, not through people like that uh, main character in The Secret Diaries of a call girl who actually want to do this and can make a good living out of it. No, you're dealing with drug-addled women or children that are imported from other countries, people that are the victims of human trafficking and sex tourism in countries like Thailand and Bangladesh and uh, other countries that are nowhere near where Canada and the UK and the United States are. It's not to say that developed countries don't have issues with human trafficking, but there is a, a level of prostitution that can exist in the West that is not forced or human trafficking and is consensual and is, for whatever reason to some women, an industry in a way that doesn't exist in most of the countries with the human rights abuses that would uh, normally trip Amnesty International's radar in the first place. Now, that being said... Amnesty International does not have lawmaking authority. They can lobby, they can endorse, they can do all that stuff. It doesn't mean they can actually pass laws. But we've seen the political clout that Amnesty has. Look at how vitriolically they attacked people like Prime Minister Harper for having someone like Omar Khadr, you know, convicted terrorist, locked up behind bars. Amnesty International, not a fan of common sense in a lot of cases. So I, I'm not worried about Amnesty International at all, because in this case, I happen to agree with the policy resolution that they passed, albeit not for the same reasons as they passed it. You see, Amnesty International, which draws all of its support, both moral and fundraising support from the left, has alienated the left. They've alienated people like the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women. They've alienated many women's rights groups. They've alienated many of the uh, groups that they frequently used to get the most support from because they've now decided to come out in support of an industry that most of these left-wing groups are now saying is not an industry. And even though Canada, for all the work and effort they put into their laws, or I should say our laws, is unlikely to cave to the new change from amnesty. I wanted to take a couple of moments to shine the light on why it is so ridiculous that we have the laws on prostitution that we now do. 
There was a documentary I saw, or I suppose a mini documentary, earlier this week that Vice had produced. Now, Vice obviously being the, the publication that once used to be good when Gavin McInnes founded it and now is basically a hipster leftist rag in many cases, trying to be edgy, but in actuality just being plain gross and, and not particularly insightful. But Vice Canada produced a documentary by a, uh, a, a so an alleged singer I'd never heard of her before. Named Howell, I believe, and and she was doing this thirty minute documentary on prostitution, and she's a, a former strip club worker, and she was trying to to attack the Conservative Party of Canada for its policies on prostitution and its new laws, and uh, that was basically the aim of the documentary, and and I felt that for a point that she could have made a lot more eloquently, she she really failed in it. I think she could have done a lot better because I was on her side and I I still didn't particularly enjoy what she actually did with it. But I was watching this and they interviewed sex workers and former sex workers and they're talking about the facts that uh, the fact that the government's laws have forced prostitution underground because they've made it so that John's are afraid of being prosecuted. And they're saying what they've actually done is they've actually tried to eradicate prostitution. And I found it interesting that anyone was surprised by that. I found it interesting that anyone was surprised that the goal of Bill C-36 wasn't to get rid of prostitution. Well, yeah, if you're making it illegal to buy something, of course you're trying to get rid of it. Why else would you do it? That's why you're having the laws in the first place. That's why we had the panels and the round tables and all of the different areas that were explored before the laws were actually passed. And and by the way, with the support of a lot of women's rights groups who for the first time are actually going to be supporting the conservatives in this election. But I find it interesting that people are surprised by this. Now, it's kind of interesting to see the split of the left on the prostitution issue. To see how the left cannibalizes itself on this matter. Feminists, even themselves, feminists, a subset of the ideological left, will be split on this issue. You have on one hand the free thought, free loving, open minded feminists who feel sex is a matter of liberation. And then you have the Andrea Dworkin feminists who believe, you know, sexual uh, intercourse is always rape. I mean, not necessarily as dramatic as that, but the radical feminists that believe that sex is a way that men subjugate women and men oppress women. Now, I'm reveling in the extremes there, but that's basically the two sides of feminism. One, the body is yours and you are empowered by having sex. B, the other, I realized I went from one to B there, but bear with me. Uh, Two, or, or B if you will. That your body is a tool that is sexualized by men. And, and these are the people that believe prostitution should be outlawed. I believe that forced prostitution should be against the law. I believe the government should go after people who are human traffickers and pimps and those who purchase sex from those who are trafficked knowingly with the full force of the law. But for the minority of people for whom prostitution is a legitimate line of work, I don't understand it. But I also don't understand how someone would want to be a liberal member of parliament. I I don't have to understand what you're choosing to do with your life or appreciate it or agree with it to recognize that you have the right to do it. And I find it interesting because people have said to me before, how can you take such a pro-life position or sorry, a pro-choice position on prostitution and not on abortion? I've been asked that question a few times. My answer is actually pretty simple, because with prostitution, you're dealing with a a choice made between two consenting adults. With uh, abortion, you're dealing with a choice made by one adult and one person, in that case, the child being denied the choice. I don't think the two are, are the same issue at all. But absolutely, it's interesting how much those who say a woman should never be told she can't do something with her body shut up when you're talking about the issue of prostitution. Because they say, well, no woman could want that. Look, I talked to one former sex worker when I had a debate on my radio show about this a year or so ago, and she said, I like sex and I like money. That was her argument. I like sex and I like money. If I can have one for the other, why not? And you know what? It's actually hard to argue with that logic. And, and I have a, a very difficult time drawing a moral line between prostitution and working in a strip club. They're both sexualizing yourself for money, selling your body for money. The difference is basically what happens to your body. 
The difference is how close one gets to your body, but you're still capitalizing off the fact that you have a commodity, your body, your attractiveness, your sexuality that someone else wants to pay for. And it's not even about selling your body. It's really more about renting it out, but I guess that's just a matter of splitting hairs. Or not, depending on what you like. I I don't know. I'm not here to judge. So I I have to wonder what is going to happen, because I don't buy that the Supreme Court is going to find the new prostitution laws, the so-called Nordic model laws in Canada, to be any more acceptable than the old laws, which put most of the burden on those who are selling it, or at least advertising it. I don't think that these are going to be found to be constitutional anyway. And this will be really interesting. I mean, even though Stephen Harper has had the ability to stack the court in his favor, I would not acknowledge that he's done a good job in doing that. The court has not been good to him. The Supreme Court has repeatedly gone after decisions that he's made on a number of issues. And I'm not sure prostitution will be one of these. Look, I guess my question on this matter is... Where do we go? I mean, where is the line at which someone is no longer able to decide for themselves what they want to do with their own body? Where's the line? Where's the point? I'm not comparing prostitutes to police officers, but both put their lives potentially in harm's way for money. I'm not putting them on a level of moral equivalence, don't worry. But if the issue is harm... Cops might get harmed at work. Circus performers might get harmed at work. No one talks about outlawing strip clubs, but strippers are technically exposed to a lot of the same dangers that prostitutes are dealing with grabby clients. And ultimately, it's based on hoping the bars have good security, hoping the bars kick out the people that don't belong there. And that's ultimately why most prostitutes want to work in in brothels or so-called body houses, because, well, then they're going to have people that can assemble to defend them. They don't have to hide that they're doing it. They can get help without fearing prosecution. Now every John is going to be afraid of getting caught, so prostitutes are saying they're worried that they're losing business, and they are. But I don't know how the sale of something can be treated in a different way than the purchase of it. And I I find it to be quite interesting as well, because anyone who knows anything about how drugs are dealt with knows that police oftentimes, in fact, almost all the time, will go after not the users, but go after the suppliers. Cut off the head of the snake. They'll go after the dealers because they're the ones who are selling the drugs, not the people that are actually buying it. So I have to wonder why sex is viewed in the opposite way. Where we're not going to go after the suppliers, we're going to go after the people who are buying it and the people who are pulling the strings on the people who are selling it. Well, what about someone who makes the choice on their own? What about someone who, regardless of whether you or I understands it or even supports it morally, which, if I haven't made clear, I don't, but who are we to say they can't do that? Is it constitutional or not? I don't know. But it certainly doesn't seem right that the government is taking away this choice from the few who might want to make it. We've got to take a quick break here. More of Lawton Online in just a couple of moments here on The Rebel. Stay with us. It's time for It Must Be a Liberal, only on Lawton Online. Scouring every corner of the globe for stories so outrageous, there must be a liberal involved. Yes, it's time for It Must Be a Liberal, scouring every corner of the globe from Calgary to Cape Verde, from Cote d'Ivoire to, I don't know, Cancun, I guess. Finding stories so outrageous, there must be a liberal involved. Today, we actually go to Seattle, Washington, where a couple is being sued for $200,000 by their next door neighbors for damage to their property. The couple who is suing the neighbors, is complaining that they've had damage of their vehicles, damage of their lawn, damage of their sidewalks in front of their house, damage of the actual structure of the house itself. And it's not been done by the neighbors, but rather by their eight-year-old daughter. Except not by the eight-year-old daughter, except by a pigeon and a crow that the eight-year-old daughter every now and then puts food out for. 
So they're actually suing for $200,000 of damage because a bird messed up their lawn and they want to blame the one who threw the bird seed out. Well, look, I mean, I, I'm all for not, you know, making the street into a zoo, but I'm pretty sure that you can't blame your neighbors for what nature's doing. And I think it's safe to say that if you think you can get $200,000 out of your neighbors because of what a crow did, well... You're probably a liberal. There's really no other way. we got to wrap things up for today, but we'll be back next week with more of Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. I'm Andrew Lawton. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon, Canada. Thanks for tuning in to Lawton Online. Check out the Rebel.media for lots more fearless content and commentary.